Hey everybody, welcome to Big Win Radio's Toast of the Art Show. Today we welcome back Victoria Chick, who is a contemporary figurative artist and early 19th and 20th century print collector. She's based in Silver City, New Mexico, which is an amazing art community that you definitely want to check out. If you're in Southwest New Mexico, uh, go visit and also keep up with Victoria. Go to her website, victoriachick.com. She's been on our shows as an expert contributor for a number of years and also is part of our Big Blend magazines. And today she's joining us to talk about art in agriculture and or I should say our agriculture in art. That's really the way it is. It's about artists portraying agriculture in their art. And she's on our show every third Saturday. So welcome back, Victoria. How are you? Thank you, Lisa. I'm very good. Very well, hey. as a matter of fact. And, good. Uh, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about this topic. And, uh, I, I, once, you, once you came up with the idea, I, re- I did a lot of research, and I, I discovered it was a really interesting topic, and I, I found out a lot of things that I hadn't thought about before in terms of, in terms of agriculture and the art that uh, expresses it. So mm-hmm. uh, it's a, it's... I'm, I'm, um, I'm kind of excited about talking about this today. Yeah, it's pretty big. And I think it, it really, when you think about agriculture, it's really the start of civilization. I mean, you, you know, we even, Nancy, remember we went to Gila Cliff Dwellings National Monument mm-hmm. outside uh, Victoria's home, you know, mm-hmm. literally. Um, and, and it was really interesting. Here you are in these uh, ancient cliff dwellings of the ancient peoples, the Membres, and, you know, you're up there and you had to go up and down to get your your agriculture, your food. So they were hunter and yes. gatherers, but then at the same time, they started to grow crops like corn. But that was on top exactly. of the caves or way down by the water yes. source. And it was up and down. So you've got to think about how old, you know, how long ago that was happening. Well, you and know, that was part was, of was, civilization. When you talk about, about Neolithic culture, which essentially that was, even though it was only about all... 1100 to 800 years ago, um, when you go back maybe like 8,000 years ago, there were areas in the world that were living the same way. So the, the Neolithic lifestyle persisted um, in many areas of the world at different times. Um, even even in the 20th century, there are, were times that were Neolithic or very close to that um, in certain in certain real primitive areas, so it's it's not like a like a timeline. It's more it's more sporadic than that, and more more spread out than that. But you're right. Um, people when people started growing crops, they, 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 it occurred at a time when they started living together, and they were and, and hunter being hunter gatherers was no longer sufficient. Uh, so they started they started raising. Certain certain crops, grains especially, um, mm. to get their sustenance. And um, once they started growing things, they started they started doing other things that were re- agriculturally related, like weaving. And mm. and we see they were they did. We you have to weave in a pattern for it to work. Uh, they realized that growing growing crops was more efficient in rows. Um, sometimes they went on contours around the ground. So the repetition of pattern became part of their life. And you start to see that repetition expressed in the artwork that was produced. So that that's that was um, an interesting thing, because repetition is one of the uh, elements of art uh, mm. of design that is universal. And so it came about very, very early as, as a way people organize things. So that's, um, and we're still that's, using that today. Yeah, that's because it makes, it makes the viewer feel comfortable. Right. You know, when, when you do one off thing, the viewer is uncomfortable. But when you bring in a pattern, because we work in patterns, we walk in a pattern, we breathe in a pattern, it makes you comfortable. When right. the pattern is disrupted, then you're uncomfortable. So I think that's part of whether they knew they were doing that knowingly or not. 
that I, I don't know, but I think that patterns <laughs> in crop, yeah, I don't know if they're like, oh, let's paint the crops because it's a pattern and people looking at the painting right. will feel comfy. I don't think they went well, there. I think, I think, I th I think that's really ingrained in us. For, um, like, con like conscience is ingrained, sort of. I mean, mm. the ways of with human beings organize things. And like, the neat thing about it to me is that we in this century can look back you know, centuries and centuries and, and eons mm -hmm. in the past and, and see artwork that was done then, and we still react positively to it. We understand it. We understand mm -hmm. the organization because it's, it's part of us. It's part of what yes. we do, too. Mm -hmm. mm. Absolutely. Well, I think it's interesting, too, when you look at this, because when you talk about patterns, we've been doing that uh, as civilizations for years in jewelry. Um, you know, if you look yeah. at, you know, if I look at a Maasai tribe and the Maasai jewelry, each color represented a different uh, feeling, emotion, or message. And that's why I never got far in jewelry, because I got so stuck in <laughs> these messages of colors and patterns mean something, too. If mm -hmm. a pattern goes up or well, down, this jewelry means goes, something. Yeah. Even, yeah. even stringing beads is, a, is the simplest kind of pattern you can get. Yeah. Yeah. Just like basket weaving does it, you know, all of that. So there were designs in there and it was a communication. And so it, it's right. interesting. If we get into Native American cultures, a lot of those patterns and designs meant something and or and still do not meant, you yeah. know, um, they still do. And so it's it's interesting when it starts to now reinforce, oh, this was corn or, you know, hey, we start to bring cattle into our lives. And so. Uh, it goes back into our conversations also before with rock art, uh, pictographs, petroglyphs. Uh, you'll see right. some of that in there. And I think it's fascinating that just that, the patterns, like you're talking, look at crop circles. They say mm -hmm. that that stuff's ancient. Look at Stonehenge, you know. So yeah. what we've been doing, we've been, we want structure and routine. Nancy's right. We want this. This is how we need to be. We've been nomadic and now we're tired and now we want structure and routine. But nature has routine and structure, but she'll always go, hello, I'm going to give you extra snowfall this year. Or, sorry, <laughs> we're going to give you a drought and you may want to move for a little bit um, and get some water <laughs> somewhere. And then the art will change. And that's the beauty. We've talked about it on shows where art documents history all the time. Well, well, what happened? Nature, nature has a big part of it. And mm -hmm. definitely... Um, and but another thing that happens is like when we moved out of the Neolithic era and into the ancient era, where things some things got recorded and some things um, artwork has been less left to us. We we see that the art changes a lot, mainly because. Um, and I'll call it politics, but it, the organization of society changes. And mm -hmm. you wind up with it with somebody who has a lot of power and commands armies and so forth. And the art then that gets produced at that time tends to glorify the leader, uh, glorify the battles that they have won. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, <laughs> so you don't see, I mean, uh, you don't see agri agri or art in agri excuse me, you don't see agriculture and art during very much during the I'll call it emper empire building period. And that would be mm -hmm. that would include like oh Persia and uh the Medes and um Assyria, Babylon. Um when you get to Egypt there are there are some things in, in Egyptian art in the tombs that are agriculturally related, mm -hmm. but not a lot. Because yeah. most of most of that stuff was inside tombs to, to uh, bring uh, sustenance to the ruler after death. So nobody really was it was not intended for anybody to see. Oh. Hmm. So that that's the it, oh so it's like that's what you did. Now you're going to go up with it, but it's not for yeah. It was it's almost not a pride thing in a way. It's like oh this is our day to day, but who we are. It's like keeping up with the Joneses where this is our face. This is, you know, there's a pride because also like you, in your article and everyone, uh, Victoria's got a great article on this that it's pretty in depth. I mean, this is some interesting history 
Uh, if you go to blendradioandtv.com, you'll find it in one of the upcoming issues of Big Blend Magazines, doc, uh, Big Blend Magazines as well. But um, you talk about how it was really art goes from those really ancient periods into, okay, now we're going to just, it's all about our kings and queens and mostly kings, right? Because I don't think even women at one point oh, were very, very, in there. Very few women. Uh, Nefertiti was was one who mm-hmm. was revered and Hatshepsut, in, in, uh, she was actually became, a, she was a woman pharaoh. Um, but she was the only one that I can think of. Um <sighs> But the other part of the the other part of the king thing is that uh, along with along with the king, the king uh, had to had to get his power from somewhere, and uh, they would you know they would manufacture a god or they would identify what what was a god to them or represented a god represented a god, and so we also had artwork that had to do with that. Mm. Um, so. It, in any way, all through that empire building, you didn't have much more than um, political, political, religious um, artwork that was done. Um, mm. You didn't. It didn't come out of that until the Roman period, um, the late Roman period, and that would be um, maybe about the fourth century when um, Christianity became the identified religion of Rome. Mm. So, and because Rome controlled most of the land, that uh, that religion was uh, also adopted or forced on population. So mm-hmm. most of most of Europe gradually became Christianized. Um, and as as that happened, the 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 artwork expressed. Uh, they expressed Christianity at first. A little after, you know, a few, a couple of centuries, more mythology worked its way in. So you had paintings done of, of uh, Greek and Roman mythology in addition to Christian Christian um, scenes and um, topics. So that was another big change. But it was again, it was political religious. Mm-hmm. And all that, in, in, um, the only thing I could I could think of a couple of, of kind of exceptions where agricultural work started to, to be introduced again, and that um, was in the old 14th century, which would be the late Gothic uh, in Italy. Um, there was a, there was a, a mural painted in the um, like the town, like the town hall, mm-hmm. kind of, um, yes. by Ambrosio Lorenzetti, and it was titled "Good Government in the Country," and it was a fresco uh, cool. showing how how organization and uh, good government helps helps farmers. So you see people plowing. You see everything in the, in this fresco is just sort of uh, idealized um, from an agricultural standpoint. Everybody is happy. <laughs> Um, it, it sounds so one, like it was so, like a setup. Was, um, <laughs> was a Renaissance, a series of Renaissance paintings. It was, it was a book um, of religious art, a uh, very small book actually. Um, but it had little little vignettes, one for each month, and it showed it showed what what life should be like because it was it was done for the Duke de Berry and who was in France, and it was a like a Psalter, it was a religious book. But it remind, supposed to remind him of his responsibility to the peasants, because by that mm. time you had a different form of government. You had small fiefdoms and um, castles, and you had the, the, the peasants lived in, in the outside outskirts. And but they looked to him for protection, so he felt um, he felt his responsibility, and that was a good that was a good thing. Um, the biggest change, I think, was in the in the uh, 17th century, and that was uh, basically in the in, in the area that we now call Holland. Uh, the Dutch um, threw off all kinds of they they got rid of the king. By that time, France was mm-hmm. was uh, trying to control that area. Um, they they bought off the, the French king, 
and they also adopted a Protestant form of religion. So they 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 did not favor the Catholic Church. So you had two things going at that in the 17th century at that time location where all of a sudden they were governing themselves. They no, government was not being imposed on them, and religion was not being imposed on uh, on them either. So their artwork changed completely. Uh, they had no wow. religious uh, art. <laughs> they they had no um, no king to uh, pay homage to, and so they their their clients their their patrons of art were the tradespeople, and so they started they started doing scenes of mm-hmm. more common everyday life, and one of those things was was agriculture related. Um, they painted they painted pictures of uh, the farmers, you know, prized cows, for instance, or their prized horses. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, there was <laughs> it was a big change at that time. Holland hadn't gotten into the into the tulip business yet, but um, it wasn't wasn't oh, yeah. long before they were painting fields of of, of tulips that uh, they were certainly noted for at the time. But that's also agriculture so, too. When you think about that, yeah, um, sure. Yeah, <laughs> excuse me. They weren't yeah. like in the wild, you know, not tulips in the no. wild. They were all like in rows. And there's something. And of course, about- they were they were a water a water based uh, economy in a way because they they did a lot of fishing. So there were a lot of also a lot of paintings that were done um, of of I'll call it aquaculture maybe. Uh, although they did they were they were to growing the fish. They were actually going out to catch them. But um, but but you can see what I mean by the the whole the whole tenor of what was painted changed in the 17th century in that part of the world. Mm. And that, and they have, that their change affected other, other countries around them changed in the France, for instance, uh, up to, up until the late the 17th century, people in France just didn't pay, paint like a vase of flowers. That was, they had, they were doing religious things or, or things for their, their, their Kings. So, um, it was kind of a big, a big change, just overall. Mm. I, you know, I, you had to get paid for your paintings in some manner, so yes. you had to paint what people were willing to pay for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's but, interesting. At that time, there were so many people who became painters, really mm-hmm. good painters. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes you'll see, you'll see in certain centuries, certain arts are are more outstanding than other times. In the 18th mm-hmm. century in France, for instance, music was uh, was really blossoming. In the 17th century in 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 Holland, um, it was it was the fine it was fine art um, painting. It's um, interesting. We you talk about the music because the the fine art came in, and then you in your article you talk about. Um, a lot of the different artists that started coming through, like uh, Millet, and um, the, it was him. And then um, you you go on, you know, through the centuries, and the the people. It wasn't. It was. It was. There was Sisley or Sisley, if I pronounce it correct. Sisley. Um, and then Charles de Muth, and then Blanche Morgan, and certain you know all these people. But I was going through their artwork. And what I found really interesting was some of them were painting music in barns. There was music in the fields. There, they, the music and the agriculture were holding hands, basically. Yeah. And so yeah. one of them, I was like, well, can we use this picture? But it's like there and it was a series that he was doing on music. Now I need to go find that now. Um, and it was it, it was Eastman. It was Eastman. It was William Sidney Mount that did it. He was the one. Well, okay. Who did this, yeah, he was the one who did the whole thing on music, and he had music in. Um, he went in through the south, I think it was. Like he went through the south, of, you know, and and um, did like a whole series. Like he was like, oh, a Negro cabin with people playing music. Then he went to white people's barns where they were playing music. It was pretty interesting, what he did. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of interesting things in in, the Amer- in America at that time. Um, it, it kind of it kind of started that trend started in in the 18th century in England, 
um, there was there was a painter named John Constable, and if you, if you think of um, mm. well, even the, even the early nineteenth century, late eighty late eighteenth and early nineteenth centuries, and moving moving through the through the nineteenth century, a lot of people were moving out of farms because the industrial revolution took place, and people moved to the cities because they thought they would have a better life. Well, the city became really crowded. They were really, they were so unhealthy. I mean, because there were these factories belching smoke, there was disease, people, the water mm. was, was certainly uh, contaminated. I mean, everything that you could think of that uh, would contribute to ill health was going on, especially in England, um, where, where this was going on. And um, at that point, people started romanticizing what they had left the farms. And so they would paint pictures of farm life and it would be idyllic. Uh, there was like no horse manure lying around. <laughs> you know, yeah. everything was clean. Mm-hmm. Everything was pristine. Mm-hmm. And uh, and everybody was happy. And the so, sun was always um, shining. And, the, and uh, Constable <laughs> did a beautiful job of, of expressing this. So that, that tradition moved over to the United States. And um, when America was first uh, inhabited by the by the or first I'll call them when the colonies were really established after the Revo- after the American Revolution, the um, the portraiture was was going on and um, it was common folk that were being having their portraits painted, but we didn't see, we didn't see landscapes. Um, it was it was of course you got to realize at that time there were probably not a lot of artists in America either. Mm-hmm. So uh, the people that were available um, who had some talent probably also had other jobs. So art was not a big a big income producer uh, during the colonies. Later on it was <laughs> and people there was their still life became important. They would they would because so many people had to hunt for their livelihood or for just to supply their families with food. Uh, you see still life with you know a dead bird or mm-hmm. some you know some with some other accoutrements of the hunt and uh these are really really well done um and very in a very realistic uh style but yeah, it, um it's fast like this is James so fascinating because, yeah james Audubon the, did a he, lot he's of that. standing there with his rifle and pheasants hanging upside down on on a hook on the wall right yeah, and, what, and the then ones you're talking now about we have in the north. South, yeah. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Um, I, sometimes I don't hear you really well, so I <laughs> probably talk over you, but I don't mean to do that. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about the things that you were talking about earlier about the the paintings of the South, where um, musical instruments seem to be a big part of it, and that that carries along the constable idea that that everybody in the everybody in the country is really happy, mm-hmm. and uh, it was it was probably not not a realistic view of what was mm-hmm. actually going on, but uh, but they are really wonderful paintings, and some some of the paintings were done by um, I could say African Americans. Sometimes sometimes they were done by uh, not colonists because we were beyond that, but but um, immigrants from 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 Europe. So. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a that was a a theme that I don't think has entirely uh, died out. I think there's there's a, there are a number of a number of painters who still do that. Most often you will see them, and there's some really really fabulous painters that do this. Only we're likely to call them illustrators. And uh, calendar art blossomed mm-hmm. uh, a little bit later. Um, in the tw- calendar art blossomed in the 20th century early, um, but they would in calendar art they want most it's, it was usually an advertising tool. So they wanted, Almost, yeah, they wanted Andy Warhol. To, they wanted to make people they wanted to make their customers happy. So they would have the most um, I will I don't would say innocuous um, because they, but they would have subjects that couldn't offend anybody in their in their eyes that these subjects were just really nice subjects and and, and people would enjoy them. And, and, so, and they're um, realistic. They're, they're yes, realistic. And they're, and they were all very realistic. 
Yeah. So you can identify with them. They're not abstract art at all because abstract mm -hmm. is something that came on later when people finally said, can we not do something different? Mm -hmm. And then right. some people liked abstract and others were like, what the heck is that? You know? Yeah. So, but art was a way of recording history, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And um, <laughs> excuse me. Yeah. In the in the nineteen thirties, there was there were a number of painters in the United States that had kind of uh, felt like they needed to be more modern, and so they did mm -hmm. make up a sort of abstraction, but you could always tell what it was. You know, like uh, Will Charles de Muth used to used mm -hmm. to agricultural uh, buildings like like silos and grain elevators, and they were they were very stylized. Mm -hmm. um, but they were they were very they were popular because they were recognizable. The subject was actually recognizable, mm -hmm. and there's always been um, a smaller not amount of people in in the in the history of of art who mm -hmm. um, of Western art, I should say, who probably mm -hmm. um, have a have a harder time uh, appreciating uh, abstraction, for instance. Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah. that that abstraction types of of um, works were always limited in their appreciation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you know it's like oh, I recognize that. So as soon as you recognize something, you feel some kind of emotion. When you look at something that you don't recognize, and you're like, "What is that?" Then I think the emotion is going to be apprehension because you don't know what you're looking at. Right. So you feel uncomfortable. And so would you put something uncomfortable on, on the wall? Or yeah. would you put something people, that, yeah. You know what people, I mean? People don't, people want to react um, at, a, at a low, at a, I'd say a gut level. Um, mm -hmm. And if they have to think about something, if they have to interpret it, they'll, yeah. most people will write it off because that's yeah. a lot of work. Yeah, and you, what if? And you always think, what if I'm wrong? And everybody else is going to say no. It means this, and then yeah. you're like, so, I mean, yeah. I remember, you know, in in high school, you'd read some chapter of somebody's book, and everybody thought it meant that. And I'm like, well, actually, I think it means this. And then the teacher would be like, well, maybe you're both wrong or you're both right. I'm like, thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, by the time by the time um, the depression came. Um, art, a lot, or a lot of artists, and and uh, the WPA had programs mm. um, to hire to furnish artists with jobs, mm. and uh, there were the WPA program produced uh, an incredible number of artists involved in graphic art, like lithography, for instance, or etchings, or uh, even woodcuts, um, mm -hmm. work that was reproduced. And many and and because it was reproduced, that allowed for more people to have it, to buy it, to put it mm -hmm. in their homes. Yeah. And so, um, and most of the most of the subjects had to do with um, everyday activity, not necessarily mm -hmm. always rural. Sometimes it was um, shipyard work, or mm -hmm. sometimes uh, yeah. uh, skyscrapers, mm -hmm. and, and there was a big variety of, of subject matter. Mm -hmm. But it was it was work that was really appreciated. But there was there was an incredible amount of work that depicted agricultural activity. Yeah. I wanted to touch on that because I mean they you were talking about all the people involved, where there were European immigrants, there was also African slaves that were put to work and in some pictures too. And ranching became a thing. And then one thing I wanted to just comment on this whole thing with some of these paintings that there are ones with the idyllic orchards with the fruit hanging you know beautifully from the tree i know that's where the calendar art probably went Ooh, look at the bounty and it seemed like in, in some ways i wonder about it. it's like this idyllic setting but it's not showing it where you know here's the apple orchard in the middle of winter like it where the tree looks dead the vines of the grape the grape the grape the vineyards are dead but they're not like they're doing their thing but all the painters like it it's i wonder how many people had paintings done 
to show the bounty. Like it's, it's it like, this is my bounty. This is what our farm produced, you know, once, and it takes time for that, you know, pear tree or apple tree vineyard to produce. So that's something also interesting about, you know, agriculture being an art is that it, it's going to take time for it to be kind of worthy. Yeah. Like to me, I'm sorry, but I think all stages of plant growth are well, fascinating and cool yeah. but you know what i mean i think i think artists artists tend to like you say want to want to depict the bounty the lushness um mm -hmm. the the growth you know all the all the things that we i tend to idealize about about agriculture you know the, the mm -hmm. huge apples you know the clusters of grapes and all that um and you're right, color. you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, of uh, time that it takes to produce that and a lot of, a lot of waiting time for the people that plant the vines and, and so forth to, to have a benefit from it. But, but you, always, just... you always see the, like the, like the cranberry pickers. Uh, yes. <laughs> this is a good example of, of mm -hmm. people Perfect. who, they, they've been out, now this is something that they didn't plant, they're just out picking cranberries, but if there's only a certain season that it can be done, and there's you know, a throng of people out there in the bogs picking cranberries, and you see that some of them are, some of them are really industrious, some of them are laying down because they're just fagged out, <laughs> resting. So, um, so in some in some cases, I think they, the, uh, the artist picked up on on the realist, the realism part of um, of the of the romance of agriculture, but also I think the color, like if there's an apple tree with no apples on it, then you have a green tree, and so right. what's the difference between that and the next green tree? You know, um, so now you hang some apples on there or some oranges on there, now you got some color. And for artists, color is way more interesting than just, oh, it's green. Even though there's a bunch you know, one, of different one greens. One thing we don't think about, one we don't think about is art. And I didn't mention it in, in the article I wrote. Mm -hmm. But um, in the 50s, well, 60s, 50s, 40s, 30s, and 20s, and down to the down to maybe closer to the 1900s. Mm -hmm. When when agriculture, when, pro, when produce was packed, it was packed in crates. And at the mm -hmm. end of each crate, uh, at the end of, of the crates, there were labels, and they mm -hmm. were fabulous, oh, yeah. fabulous uh, depictions of the, like the valley where the, where mm -hmm. the produce was grown or something. Um, there was a there was a form of art that was really really um, rich. I think mm -hmm. uh, oh. it was simplified, and the colors were great, and, yeah. and uh, it, it was probably discounted because people, it was a heck of a label, you know, yeah, but, but the artists who did them um, were, were really, I think, quite good. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, so being in Central California, Tulare County, um, everyone uh, go to check out our quality of life magazine right now has the yeah, Tulare County as an agricultural destination. They grow majority of the produce we have in our country. Um, I think it's two to 300 crops and dairy and all of that. And so you go in the downtown communities and it's outside Sequoia National Park and everything. And not only if you go in their museums, they have the original, the, the original packing labels. I mean, these labels are yeah. a big oh, deal. That's cool. yeah. And yeah, it's when cool. you go in their towns, not only are they just in the museums, the muralists recreate these labels on the buildings as, you know, P huge pieces of artwork it's such a huge thing because like in Exeter California they had these grapes that eventually went away these specific grapes that are really like table grapes the emperor mm -hmm. grape is what they're right. called and then they changed grapes to another thing because trends change right now we all want small easy little things you know we want baby you know carrots and baby potatoes versus <laughs> the big you know we've changed and so agriculture not only has to deal with the weather and the and politics and you know all of that yes. and you know are my small farmers going to really suffer or am i going to be the big ag dude you know and then they have to go with the trends of what the consumer wants 
Yeah. And so well, yeah. these and, labels... And, and think, yeah, I think of the lag time there because the consumer decides they want something or enough consumers decide they want something and it become, it, it's written up and so now it's trendy. And the farmer has to, has to change his way of harvesting mm-hmm. probably for something yeah, and then, smaller. And then also, yeah. just from the soil perspective, you can't yep. keep growing the same crop. No, Your soil is yeah, going it. to get depleted, so you've got to change it up. So the farmer is trying to please the the mass humanity of what they have suddenly decided is great. And the soil goes, we're done with that. Right. But I want to go back to the labels because some of the labels that I find really incredible from these museums we've been to and all these packaging labels, there's a huge amount of them that have the Rosie the Riveter like in oh, there yeah. because um, women yes. took mm-hmm. over farms for and and it's happening to this day we have been on farms oh. where the women are running it the women are doing making the wine you know it, it's it's a changeover but in that time frame you got to think world war ii right and so yes, central yes. california yeah. you go on farms there they will show you watchtowers there's farmer bob has a watchtower Mm-hmm. And you go through and yeah, and then you've got to think Manzanar is on Highway 395 east of the Sierras. And that yeah. was a, an internment camp for the Japanese. So you've mm-hmm. got to think about historically all this stuff was going on in California. And I'm just speaking California right now. We haven't even gone into the desert southwest, Phoenix, all of these the POW camps, what the Japanese were doing in the imperial. Mm-hmm. That's why we're, it's called the imperial desert. The imperial Japanese were there doing mm-hmm. gardens. Yep. And that's how the agricultural history came about. But like if you go and look at these labels, you will see Rosie the Riveter depicted in a ton because women took over the farms during World War mm-hmm. II. Yeah. It's they crazy had cool. You know, yeah, that's amazing. So well. this is again shows where what was going on in in. So art is true to it, but then it isn't where they just show, hey, you know, all the Negroes are happy in their encampment <laughs> while they're picking cotton. No, they weren't. You know what I mean? And so it depends on right. who was doing the art and who was commissioning. Um, yeah, but, yeah, but then don't there forget, were, you know, they used to sing for, in order forget. to. To and don't relieve forget. the pain. Okay, wait, one at a time. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> Nancy, go ahead. Okay, I was going to say that that African Americans would sing to relieve the pain of or express the pain of what they were being forced to do. Right. And to uh, outsiders would seem, oh, look how happy they are. Yeah. 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 There was one that I want to mention when you were saying it. There's a, there was a wonderful artist named Henry Osawa Tanner, who, uh-huh. was, who was, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the word Negro because he would have described himself that way. Yeah. And he was a fabulous painter, and he did a lot of, I would say, they're not, not he, they were more poignant than mm-hmm. um, romantic yeah. paintings um, mm-hmm. of of people that were they weren't they weren't in a when he painted he they were relaxing they he, they weren't working they were enjoying they were enjoying their time together and they they were uh there was a there was a generational uh communication between them anyway if you ever if you ever chance to look up his his mm-hmm. work because he was a yeah. wonderful artist yeah. Wow. And I mean, that's artists portray what they think, okay, maybe the world needs this now. And then other times it needs that, like, some are trying to change things. Yeah. And others are, are, are saying, hey, this is a good aspect. It's not all doom and gloom. So, you know, it's a balance, it's a balance act. Well, there's nothing like Mother Nature and trying to grow things to get some kind of balance. And we need our balance in our (laughs) bodies. So we need that good food. I mean, it's just it's a really amazing story when you think about agriculture, you know, Mm -hmm. in the Midwest. uh, I know we touched on this in, in a previous conversation, but the Midwest, like. I think is pretty darn beautiful and lush. And I listen, I know about it in winter and I'm not doing that again, but um, (laughs) honestly, it's really interesting 
what people go through in the Midwest in these areas to be able to have this fruit of labor. I mean, it, when they yeah. say the fr fruit of labor is, it's it means you went it's through intensive. storms and you, they're out there. I mean, we think about entrepreneurship. Here's all these startup companies. We're going to do this. We've got this dot-com industry. Oh, it went bust, but we're back again. Well, what do you think farmers go through? Are you kidding me? Oh, drought. Sorry. Right. Um, you, you know, you're, you're soil. right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Soil, drought, pests. Oh, you know? pests. And, and, and then pests. somebody think bringing of insects. in. Yeah. And then, oh, don't even start me on the companies that come in. Oh, let's put this chemical on and hope it won't hurt the farmer next door. I mean, there's so much that care. goes on. So the art and the calendars, I think there's a lot of calendars to even cheer up the farmers. And I, you know, and, and calendar, you know, when you think about now, you know, we just were, we were in Tulare County last year in the spring and went through a lot of the museums and we looked at how the, the, the trucks have changed and the, the equipment has changed and people think, yeah. oh, you know, the farmers, you know, blah, blah, blah. But when you look now, they're all using digital stuff for watering. I mean, mm -hmm. it's so high well, tech. They use, they use lasers to flat, to, to put, you know, before they plow. Um, it's amazing. They, they have to irrigate. Yeah. Yeah. So do they, do, do they still have farmer's almanacs or that went out the window? somewhere oh no there's still a farmer's almanac yeah yes. absolutely yes so you they get say at walmart like get your laser out <laughs> no they talk about the weather no now listen the farmer's almanac she brings up a really good point yeah. so benjamin franklin put out yeah. the very first farmer's almanac but there was i think another one that was more serious but he popularized it basically and made it yeah. fun and he did it as entertainment he was like people mm. need this in the winter you know, mm -hmm. people, you know, and what to look forward to. And, you know, like just, it was, it's really neat. And it goes, there's a image. Um, oh, uh, uh, let me go back to the book, the Limborg brothers for yeah. French Drew de Berry, dude, the, the duck de Berry. <laughs> I better not say that <laughs> again. Um, but this was way back when, right. In, in the 1400s in France. And, right. you know, when you look at, the clocks. So this is something we didn't touch on agriculture and art. Grandfather mm -hmm. clocks are incredible with their art and farmers had these clocks. It would tell you right. about the moon. It would tell you mm -hmm. about everything. Yeah. And that there's a picture and it's in, it's in your article where it was like the farmer's almanac and that kind of, that kind of art. Like, the, you know what well, I'm talking about? Well, kind of the idea there for everything, there is a season and, mm -hmm. and the almanac carried that on. Limborg, you're right, that was a really, that was a good, uh, I will call it a precursor, because he never saw it, probably, but, but it was, it was um, topics that the farmers universally were, you know, had to know, or tried to know, mm -hmm. and so uh, putting it, in, putting it in the form of a painting, or putting it in the form of a, of a book was really useful. Yeah, because, I mean, they knew what was going on on the ground, the weather, they yep. paid more attention than other people did because they had to or they wouldn't be successful. And I just, you know, I, I always thought it was really, and then I thought, okay, in modern day times, did we give that up? I want to go get one now. I want to find Oh, no, it's almanac. there. I'll get you one in Walmart tomorrow. Okay, cool. And not, I, I mean, one. serious. They're there. They're, all, they're almanacs. Seriously. I used to get them all the time just because it would tell you this is what's expected for the weather. And now, of course, we can go online and weather.com and whatever. And is it always right? I mean, the other night we went to bed saying it was going to be warmer the next day. And then it's at two in it the morning. It. I get alerts. You're going to get snowed on. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, what? The, and, what? <laughs> you but know? then it didn't snow. So. Uh, it didn't. So there you go. But it's it's a very interesting thing about the yeah. Almanacs. And, and if now it, it would be great to go back years and see, you know, there's art mm -hmm. that tells you things. Um, we did an interview with Rufino Winery at the very beginning of our shows, like the very beginning. We didn't know what we were doing. And here we are talking to one of the biggest wine producers in Italy and, you know, going, what the hell are we doing? <laughs> but 
he um, came on our show and, and their winery had been going for over a hundred years. Wow. And he was yeah. talking about writing in his, their book every day, what was going on with the weather. And he could mm-hmm. chart weather patterns by this book. It yeah. was like their yeah. own, you know, wine Bible. And, you know, I have got to imagine the, 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 the drawings and, you know, things like that. You got to think how, you know, you're going to do agriculture itself. Farmers had to have done diagrams as they, you know, now we're all fancy, but back in the day, you had to have some kind of art skill somewhere to draw what you were doing so that your kids would know. And so, because they were farming, that's why we had so many kids back then, you know, it was to tend to the fields. Now we don't have as many kids. Is that a good thing? I'm just kidding. Because but, we um, don't have that many farms. No, I'm just, yeah. But now it's, <laughs> it's just changed, right? But um, if you think back then, art and agriculture went hand in hand because you had to portray what you did. You had to. Same as botanical uh, images and the avian art, all of that. You had to document what you were doing in some way. And you couldn't always do it with words. There's no way you're going to say, now plant three to the left and three to the right and uh, put a middle thing. No, you needed a, you needed a diagram somewhere. And that's still art as far as I'm concerned. That's just my opinion. <laughs> well, it, it, well, today is the birthday of, uh, gosh, what was his name? Um, he's a Dutch dude who oh, started actually drawing what he felt the planets look like from where he was. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he um, and he got into trouble. They got rode out of town on a donkey kind of thing because he said the sun, that the planets were revolving around the sun. This is in the mid-1800s. And he said the planets were revolving around the sun. And so he was going against the bigwigs who already said, no, that's not what's happening. But so he, and for him, in an artistic way, he did, he, he had his normal planetary, and, and one of the first, he built his home as a, a planetarium, like the first floor was square and the second floor was round, so visitors could come and see the stars and all that, so he's really into it on a scientific basis. But he was also an artist, so he separated his stuff out. So on a scientific basis, he would say, well, the planets are doing this. But then you go paint the opposite and got in so much trouble. It's really interesting that people took it so, like, if someone did that today, we go, well, whatever. Yeah. But, or you might even be famous for it. But he got into big trouble. He got rode out of town. That's an interesting story. Yeah. Yeah. It, but it just, it, at least he didn't do crazy. like, like you know, um, so long as it's not painting the earth as flat with ice walls. But he That's, probably would have done something like that. He had that kind of, what about it, this? No, 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 we don't <laughs> want that. Listen, the earth is round. I just want to remind people while I can <laughs> that the earth is round and there are no ice walls. If there are ice walls, Nancy and I would have driven into them by now. Um, I'm just, <laughs> excuse me. It's really as true. many miles as you've driven. I, 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 you, you had to come across them. So. Oh, it's, seriously? It's, you know, Google, because you have GPS, you know, Big Brother. Um, no. <laughs> just on what I used on GPS last year, just on GPS alone, not like all the other stuff we've done. Said we did over, like over 30 something thousand miles. It was like 1,600 cities. No kidding. Like, uh-huh. how. I mean, and you know that we also like sit in an area just for two weeks, just working, you know, sit on our butts and at a computer. So it's kind of amazing. So yeah, we would have driven into the ice walls, you know, especially yeah. when we're I in think, Madison, I think Wisconsin we need to for sit, winter. I, I think you need to submit <laughs> something to Ripley's Believe It or Not about all the places you've been. <laughs> I know, really. Yeah. Like I've been there everywhere, man. But yeah, can we do, can we do a... Uh, uh, the Ripley's believe it or not on ice walls <laughs> that's what I want to do <laughs> seriously I have a thing about this it's just crazy but you know it is what it is but oh this is such a cool topic and I think it's just one that you know it is interesting how it went into calendar art and then of course illustrations 
got to think about cookbooks. And you know, you know yeah. cookbooks. And the, and the thing is, the thing is, our, our agriculture, we're talking about art, but agriculture touches everything and everybody mm -hmm. and, every, oh, yes. and every life. Yes. And um, what do you think? What do you think? I mean, I consider that, that I owe a lot to farmers, <laughs> truly. Well, yeah. Otherwise, yes. What would we be eating? I know, and and <laughs> from that, the trickle down from that is you, the transportation people, the shops, the even online. However, you're getting your produce in your house. Someone gave it to you. Someone shipped it. Someone yeah. walked it to your door. They I mean, it grew it. They Amazon. It. I don't know if Amazon's into that now. I don't know, but you know, it's it's um, Didn't it's amazing. It. And even if you're growing it yourself, you know how much work goes into a garden and i think that's awesome growing your own food i know you do that too you know victoria mm -hmm. but sure. you're out there looking for that rabbit that's going to go at your corn or what your i like the lettuce rabbits. or your carrots let's get right with the with the uh with what a rabbit's going to do but a rabbit's going to get in there and, and you know when the rabbit's coming you're going to be out there watching every day so you know your time is now going <laughs> towards that rabbit right <laughs> you, you know right. what i mean so just that's one rabbit in one household. And you know, there's deer, there's all of that. And I love all of them. So to me, like I eat, eat away, you know, plant enough for them. But um, yep. others don't believe in that theory. But, you know, but it, it's interesting. It is very connected. I also thought what was great about agriculture, you brought in the ranching. You know, like I go back to Exeter, going back to Tulare County, Exeter, shows this evolution of how they became a ranching community, a citrus community, a grape community. And then, okay, we're not doing this anymore. Now we're doing that. Like it shows this whole change of what they were growing and what they were doing and how cattle came in. And then it's ranching for beef. Then it goes to dairy if you go around the corner. You know, so it's kind of interesting because yep. all of it's related. Like you were mm -hmm. talking about tulips, the tulips are related. The flowers are related. We just did that article for Quality of Life magazine just for about kids connecting with their food because a lot of kids, even in their area, they a lot of their agricultural programs, even though they are in one of the biggest agricultural zones, not just in this country, in the world, they have right. to educate their own kids. Like it's mm -hmm. crazy. You'd think, you'd think they would just naturally know. No. They have to educate the kids that know the orange actually comes from here. And, you know, your second uncle grew it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know what I mean? So it's it's a, such a big deal. But, you know, when it was writing the article, it was like it was connected to all the plants, the flowers, the giant sequoia trees. There's a reason why something grows in a certain area and wine yep. and, you know, all of that. I had to bring in wine. So it's it's. <laughs> It's fascinating because eventually, didn't this lead to an article you did a long time ago, too? And Nancy brought it up uh, this afternoon before we recorded that it, here we go, the still lifes with the food and the fruit mm -hmm. and the bowl and the flowers. The flowers mm -hmm. and the fruit went together, right? And we do that in our homes across yeah. the country, you know? Well, yeah. wherever there's fruit, there's usually a flower. Mm -hmm. so, yep. Yeah. Yep. All good. Yeah. All good. Well, everyone, victoriachick.com is the website to go to. Before you leave, how is everything going in Silver City, New Mexico? Uh, you are working on this huge project that you started. And, it, and I remember you saying, Nancy, Lisa, you know, I want a, you know, a fine art museum in Silver City. It's an <laughs> art community. It should start getting like Santa Fe and Taos. And, but to do that, we need to have well, this museum. And now how it's now a regional museum. It's the Southwest Regional Museum of Art and Art Center. Um, how well, is it going? It's, uh, it's, it seems like a natural. Um, and, and we have a lot of enthusiasm for, from the general population. And we have some enthusiasm for people who have the ability to uh, make it happen, and, and that's not mm. me, <laughs> uh, because right now uh, we are we have made a, re a monetary request to the New Mexico State Legislature, mm. and we're we are asking for a f amount of money to purchase a building in Silver City. Mm. So uh, we will know if that 
if that will come to fruition, if we'll get everything that we need or if we'll get part of what we need. So right now we're kind of waiting to see what happens there before we yeah. we uh, continue on with um, local fundraising. Yeah. So um, <laughs> that's, about, that's about all I can say. I think fingers, right now. fingers um, and toes crossed. There are, other, there are a lot of other, uh, other arts things going on. Uh, the, the Clay Festival just made its announcement this week. Um, it will be happening in in uh, July, and but the, the there are so many things that need to get ready for that. We're having an international art ex, art exhibit. Um, people can start start thinking about entering that. Look at look up clayfestival dot com, mm. or maybe it's dot org. I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, um, uh. I'll look it there's up now. A lot, there's a lot going on, and we're having we're having uh, we're talking about having a, an art film festival too. So that's that's exciting. Nice. Oh, that's all. It's and it is uh, clayfestival dot com. We'll take you there for Silver City, New okay. Mexico. Yeah, there's okay. so much art Thanks. going on that, and then spring there's normally the gallery walk and studio tours and all kinds of good stuff. So uh, Silver City uh, is a great place if you love art. Again, southwest um, New Mexico, very near Tucson, between Tucson and El Paso is, you know, El Paso. Uh, <laughs> you want to go check it out? <laughs> I had to do that. Um, it's, it's a great place to go visit. And also the Gila Cliff Dwellings National Monument. Uh, also the Gila Wilderness Area is all out there in the Gila National Forest. It's one of our first places designated mm -hmm. as a natural space that needs to be protected and historical yep. reference as well. So check it out. Again, uh, Victoria is on our show every third Saturday. Keep up with us at bigblendradio.com. And you can read Victoria's article on blendradioandtv.com. Thank you so much, Victoria. Oh, well, thank you. Have a wonderful week. You too.